yet. It might be terrible, you don't know yet. All right. So uh, we're going to finish out Beside Salt Lake City with a kind of obscure set of skills and how they affect our community. So we're going to talk about our unconventional community. And we all know that the hacker community is a little eccentric, which is awesome. It makes our cons awesome. It makes our parties awesome. But we don't really talk about it from a learning and a corporate working perspective. Um, so let's start out with, for the three people here who I haven't annoyed yet, um, my name's Leslie Carhart. I run an IR team. I've been doing InfoSec for, God, almost a decade now, and I've been working in IT, general, all sorts of areas of electronics and tech for about 18 years, which is terrifying to me, and yes, I'm really that old. Um, I blog, I speak, Newsweek says I'm an influential cyber work consultant, which makes my grandmother very happy. I am staff at Circle CityCon, and I do a lot of resume editing for you guys. Um, and I do other stuff, too. I am a martial artist, a marksman, and a reservist. All right, so what are we doing here, talking about our unconventional community? Well, today we're going to talk about all of the stuff we do other than hack stuff, get shells, pwn stuff, all the cool stuff in the, the dual core songs. Um, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about why that's important to us in security. And so what does that mean in more sensible words? That means we're going to talk about cross-discipline research. And I have some unfortunate news for everybody here today. Um, keep in mind that the camera's facing me, not you, but you are my demo today. So you are, there is, this is an atheist presentation. There's no demo gods here. So uh, you are in charge of all the demo success or failure. So I'm going to need some audience participation, which I know all of you hate. And you're all like hiding behind your phones and your laptops now. But this, uh, there's no demo gods to save me here. It's all up to you guys. All right, so what I need you to do very first before we get anywhere else in this conversation today is I need you to sit there for a moment, close your eyes, don't fall asleep yet, and imagine a hacker. Um, if somebody wants to turn on some prodigy, that might help. Um, so yeah, picture a hacker in your mind, the perfect hacker, the best hacker you can think of, the, the leadest hacker, the coolest hacker, the person who you aspire to be or you aspire to be when you're getting into the field. Okay, everybody doing that? Awesome, cool. All right, so let's talk about that hacker you just imagined. Oh my God, green text on black. We're getting into hackerspace here. Okay, so, uh, well, there's probably some things a lot of your imaginary hackers had in common. They are socially awkward. They're probably kind of paranoid and introverted. Um, but they were, man, they were so super cool and cooler than you think you are. They started coding when they were five. They spoke at DEF CON before they were a teenager. Man, they, oh, they had a cool, cool elite handle that they uh, went by when they were a teenager. Um, they never had to work retail. They never had to enlist. They never had to go to college. At some point, they hacked into the IRS D-Base and uh, got sent to prison and got out and got a cool consulting gig. And... Um, They've, uh, they've never really learned how to do business stuff. They've never had to because they've always been so good at hacking that they've never really had to fit into the rest of the world. Um, they just kind of sit in their dark basement and they listen to their techno music and they fight the man and they probably know a mafia. That's pretty awesome, right? I wish I knew a mafia. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> so they have no family. They have no non-hacker friends. And that is your stereotypical hacker in their hoodie. All right, but as most of you know here, sitting here today, because I see not all of you are wearing black hoodies, but really, we don't look like that. Um, I mean, some of us may have some of those characteristics, which is fine and it's cool, but all of them, no. Um, not all of us started going to DEF CON when we were 10. Not all of us started coding when we were five. The only thing that really ties our community together at a fundamental level is that we like to take things apart and see how they work and make them do different things. Hacking at its most fundamental level, understanding how things work, understanding how to make computers do different things and electronics do different things. We might share some interests, like uh, there's a big trend towards Locksport and uh, a lot of us like electronic music and stuff. Yeah, we might share some interests in small groups, but 
we're all very unique individuals. And we all have very, very different backstories than the one I just showed you that our imaginary hacker has. So, first of all, if I can get three things across to you today, only three things, it's not that hard. It's time to be stop being embarrassed about whatever work is on our resume before we became an InfoSec professional or a hacker. That means everything from working in IT to working retail to being in the military to, you know, being an, an, a, uh, you know, an apple picker or something, you know, <laughs> anything. Um, that's all awesome. All that work experience makes us a better person. And secondly, as a corollary to that, um, it's time to stop being embarrassed about our hobbies. Um, we don't always have to pick locks. Some of us like totally different, non-technical things. Um, some people like clothing, some people like sports, and uh, all of that is awesome, and it's all important. You, none of, I don't see any imposters in this room. I'm try, I have like a second sense for imposters, and I'm looking out at all of you, and I don't see anybody here who's not allowed to be here because they're not hacker enough. Well, maybe one, no, okay. All right, guys, security is needed everywhere in our world, right? Can we all agree on that? Security is needed in all kinds of places, from, you know, the retail industry to the medical industry, all over the place. Information security and understanding on how hackers work is really important. Um, our information, our privacy, none of that exists in a vacuum. And we're facing a lot of problems. I think most of us can agree on that, too. Um, so what I did is I surveyed like a ton of people, most of which are in this room back at around the uh, new year. And I said, what are you worried about in 2017? So anybody who participated in that, thank you very, very much. You're awesome. So I basically said, what scares you? You know, either being a hobbyist or a student or a professional working in InfoSec or IT. What's the security problems that make you really, really nervous? And I took all those answers and I kind of generalized them into categories and I picked the top 10. And uh, what we're gonna talk about today is those top 10 things that you guys have said that you're scared about and our news media tends to agree when we're talking about security and hacking. And we're gonna talk about all those things in your background that you think are totally uncool and unhacker and how those are so, so, so important for solving those problems. Okay, so the name of the talk is about landing a plane, and uh, the reason this talk came about is I was having a conversation with a bunch of people who, like myself, have aviation degrees as well as uh, network security degrees, and uh, we were musing that we had enough skills between all of us from our prior work in aviation that we could probably get a 747 on the ground, not in, you know, in one piece, not in pieces, which is pretty cool. Um, so there's a lot of aviation security concerns out there, right? So there's the insides of the plane, the, the, the side drag and stuff, the what's connected to what IP-wise. Um, is your guest Wi-Fi connected to your avionics systems? Then, of course, there's air traffic control, which is so critical to our aircraft not running into each other or running into static objects or the ground. Then there's all the things that pilots use. I mean, I'm not, this is a whole another talk on its own. There's all the systems that pilots use to fly when they can't see or visibility is limited um, to navigate. Um, the IFR type systems, ILS, ADS, LAS, um, all the things, the signals that are going through the air that tell the, the aircraft where it is. Um, and then finally, there's everything at the airport. The passenger security, the flight line security, and the security of your baggage and the privacy involved. So a lot of people are worried about that. All right, so we know that to solve these hacker type problems, we're gonna need some people with some security skills. Doesn't have to be our super hacker in the green text on the black background who we talked about earlier, because that person probably doesn't exist, which is probably good. Um, so we know we need some, some hacker skills in our Venn diagram. But we need some other stuff to really solve this problem. We need people who know aircraft avionics, uh, things about nav aids that are satellite or ground-based. Um, we need people who know how aircraft radio works. We need to know, um, we need people who know about aerospace engineering and how aircraft fly. We need people who have experience with how air traffic control does things because that's not all documented out in neat wikis for us. 
Um, we need pilots because learning how to fly an aircraft really well takes a lot of practice and a lot of training. Um, and uh, that's not necessarily an easy thing for a hacker to pick up overnight. Um, we need flight engineers. We need people who know how airports work, right? So we need those two circles in the Venn di diagram to solve this, these sets of problems, having to deal with aviation security. All right, guys. <sighs> I know it's late in the afternoon, and I know everybody's sleepy, and I know that uh, Twitter and stuff is really exciting, but we've reached the uh, unfortunate audience participation demo segment of this talk. Um, so, okay, pretty much everybody in here, raise your hand if you consider yourself a hacker, either professionally hobbyist or just as a student, uh, interest. Yeah, a lot of hands here. So pretty much everybody in here says they're some type of hacker of varying skill levels and various niches. Super cool. You filled one circle of that Venn diagram. Here's where it gets hard. I need everybody who fits a category in that second circle in the Venn diagram, which I'm going to show you again in a minute, to raise your hand if you've done one of those things as a job in your college, in a college or a tech school, even if you didn't complete it, or as a hobbyist. And if you fit more than one of those categories, I would appreciate it very, very much if you would raise two hands or you'd stand up. This won't work without you guys. I'm putting all my faith in the community. Oh, there's already hands. Look at you guys. All right, so first Venn diagram, we've got our hackers. Second Venn diagram, who fits one of these other categories? Either, oh my god. There are a lot of ex-aviation people here. Awesome. All right, I was in AMP once. That's awesome. So we're talking about aviation maintainers, radar techs, aerospace engineering, aircraft enthusiasts, people who have worked in air, uh, air traffic control, pilots, electronics techs, radio techs, people who have worked around aircraft. All of you are the necessary people in, to, fix, to fix this critical problem, to do the talks, to give people the information they need to solve these problems. You are the necessary bridge between those fields. We need you. So let's talk about another problem, you guys. So don't feel bad if you weren't, uh, if you weren't um, one of the people who raised their hand in this section, because we've got lots more problems that are really hard to solve. Oh, boy. So um, some people have already done some interesting research in this space. Um, Chris Roberts, of course, everybody knows about him and his uh, various assorted adventures. Um, he, uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about a few talks, and you can go ahead and take a picture of these slides if you like. These are talks I thought were really interesting on bridging the two fields. Um, some top recommendations. Um, I tried not to center around a specific con, but uh, we've got Renderman talking about uh, hacking airplanes again. Uh, we've got aviation security, Hugo, Hugo Tezo. We've got... Um, uh, oh, the ADSB talk um, by Costin. Uh, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. All right, second problem. All right, so we all kind of agree that human beings cause problems in security. You know, that's always the thing we complain about. Uh, oh my God, our users, we're never going to solve any security problems because they keep clicking on things. Yeah, okay. We exist to serve end users. I'm sorry, we're there to secure them, to make business secure. We cannot operate security in a vacuum, and it's uh, unfortunate because we'd be super secure if we never had to secure any people or any of their things. Um, and we know that uh, there's more and more digital devices out there all the time that are operated by humans, which pose a big security risk. And we know that uh, we don't really control the media, out the media outreach and the media message about hacking still. I mean, there's a lot of FUD going around in the news media space about computer security. And uh, if you're up on that screen, thank you again for your commentary on why this is a terrible, terrible problem. I appreciate it very much. All right. So our Venn diagram for community outreach and education. Um, if you are, or have been, or have a hobby doing, or have had education as in education, or experience as a coach, as a Toastmaster, a community leader, a Scoutmaster, a parent, a mentor, a blogger, a podcaster, a writer, or a journalist, I would appreciate it if you would raise a hand. 
If you fit more than one of those categories, if you could raise two hands or stand up, I'd appreciate it. Oh my God, look at all those hands. I wish I could turn the camera around. You guys, we need you. Not everybody in security has those social and education skills. We need you to tell us how to do those things better. So even if you don't think you're the best hacker or the most experienced InfoSec person out there, you can lend so much by speaking at a con on one of those things and how we can use it in security to solve this problem of reaching users and reaching the news media. And some interesting talks. There hasn't been very many, unfortunately. Um, I went hunting on this topic. Um, there's uh, a lot of space to do talks and do research in this space. All right, third problem, hiring people and getting hired. Um, I saw a lot of complaints about both. Um, yes, it can be hard to break into InfoSec, especially if you're in the wrong place. And it could be really hired, hard to hire people who are experienced and are interested and motivated. Um, those connections can be very hard to make. Um, we know that we're going to need more people in security. And we know that we're going to need more qualified people. And graduating with a college degree doesn't necessarily make people qualified or motivated or interested in really learning about security. Um, inclusion is a big problem. Um, we have trouble reaching out to minorities. And that can be geographic as well as uh, any kind of social minority or ethnic minority. Um, we have a hard time of hiring people. So. All right, so we've got our hacker circle. We need people who have a little knowledge of InfoSec and hacking, but we also need people who, and you know the drill now, guys. It's not that bad. I, I hope it's not that bad. If anybody's arm falls off, I will try to sew it back on for you. If you have been a recruiter, a coach of any type, a hiring manager, a teacher, an office administrator, human resources, a mentor or a tutor, a psychologist, or a technical writer, or if you've done that as a hobby or had education in that, if you could raise a hand. More than one, two hands. All right, not as many people, but there's definitely people out there. Again, we need you to learn how to better train people and get the message out to people um, who want to get into the field. Some interesting talks. There's been quite a few, but there's a lot of ground to cover there. Um, a lot of interesting work by Johnny Christmas and Eve Adams. Um, on recruiting and getting a, starting a career in InfoSec. Um, there's been a couple of panels at DEF CON that were very, very good. Um, all, again, these are formatted like they are on YouTube or irongeek.com, so you can go look at the talks if you're interested in seeing them or learning more. All right, next problem, attribution. Everybody cringes. I see people looking angrily at me for just using the word attribution on a slide. That's great. Um, <laughs> All right, so obviously 2016, and this is a non-political zone, um, <laughs> again, as several other speakers have said. Um, 2016 brought attribution really into the media spotlight. Uh, we're talking about countries hacking other countries, influencing things, uh, you know, having influence on purchasing, marketing, all kinds of different things. Um, attribution of attackers is really, really hard, and that's kind of a catchphrase, but it really is very, very difficult. It takes a specialized skill set um, where it's necessary. It's very, very necessary, however, when you're talking about countries going to war or, you know, sanctioning other countries um, or, you know, corporations choosing not to do business in a country. Um, so it's something that we need to do to some degree in some places occasionally. And we're not very good at doing it, and it's really hard, and we are lacking people with new ideas on how to do it. All right, so this is a different set of people, and it's kind of a more unique skill set, but I think that there's probably a few people who have done this either in their college program or tech school program or in the military or as a previous career. So let's go through a few different roles that we really need information and training from as security professionals. So that would be people, people with experience in intelligence analysis, foreign studies, national security, linguistics, and translation, of course. People who are bilingual, especially in languages that are in sensitive regions from a national security perspective. Anthropologists, and I'll talk about that in a second. Politics and law enforcement. So if anybody has experience in one of those roles, please. 
there's a few people out there. There's a few people who have two hands up right now. You guys with two hands up right now, we need you. Um, this is a big problem to tackle. Um, and it might be kind of odd to think about anthropology being necessary for solving the attribution problem, but um, you've got talks like uh, Dr. Samples, um, who went and looked at soft indicators in attacks, like what hours of day did they work and when did they take breaks? Because some countries' militaries give their people breaks and others don't. Some people make them work three weeks straight without a day off. Some of them give them a day off to worship or something. So she used those anthropological indicators to start identifying threat actors on a network. So all of those different skill sets about looking at other countries, looking at languages, um, looking at uh, different cultures can be very, very useful in analyzing threats. And we need those creative ideas to solve this problem. So thank you for everybody who raised your hand. All right, this is a problem that a lot of people are familiar with. Business pressures and budgets. Um, raise your hand if you've ever had a problem getting enough money to do InfoSec well. Okay, all right, just making sure. Yeah, there's a few hands there. All right, for the people at home, I hope you're following along. Um, so executives still buy shiny black boxes that don't help us. Yes, we know that. Um, and business can sometimes override security to absurd levels um, beyond what's risk acceptable by a sensible risk management assessment. Um, and we sometimes lose arguments that we should be winning for the sake of security. Yes, we exist to serve the business, but there are points where people hold the line to an unrealistic level where a good risk manager would say, we need to make some concessions for security here. Um, no, you can't run Windows NT anymore connected to the network with your payment processing stuff. Um, all right, so that's definitely a problem. Let's talk about our Venn diagram here. So we have our accountants. We have our people who have done sales, either corporate or retail. We have people who have done business administration who can tell us like how to associate with business, how to associate with executives. We have finance people who can tell us how budgets are made and uh, finance decisions are made at a corporate level. We have project managers who know how to address schedules and budgets to an executive. We have uh, business liaisons. We have entre entrepreneurs who have done this on their own and understand how to run a small business and hire people and uh, associate with customers. And um, we have people who have just done a lot of management and know how to make those relationships work. So again, I'm not going to tell you guys this time. You know the drill. All right, hands. All right. There are a lot of people who have done those things. We need you. We need you to give talks. We need you to give trainings, even if they're informal. You know, write a blog. Tell us how we can solve this problem. You are bringing wonderful expertise to a problem that's distressing a lot of people. We just saw the show of hands. Some interesting talks. We have, um, oh, Coleman Kane. Yeah, that was a terrific talk on doing malware analysis on a, on a tight budget. Um, and uh, yeah, hacking, uh, hacking senior management at B-Sides London was wonderful, using social engineering skills to get your senior management to understand what you're saying. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of space for talks there. There's a lot of problems. All right, next problem, law and policy. Um, so we know that there's been a lot of attention on the, the cyber this year, yes. Um, and a lot of it has been incorrect and misguided attention. And a lot of, us, a lot of it will end up getting us in trouble eventually. Um, legislation that has been created and uh, suggested over the last couple of years has not been useful from a security perspective, even though legislators think it is. And um, it can also, uh, looking at parts of the EU, really inhibit our ability to do our job as pen testers or white hats. Um, or security researchers, et cetera, if it restricts our tool use or restricts our ability to report bugs or makes us more liable for damages when we do. To solve those problems, I need lawyers. I need people who have studied law. I need people who have written policy and worked with the government to create policy and legislation. I need people who have actually done work as an elected official. You know, it doesn't have to be a congressman, but maybe just working at a municipal level, understanding how to uh, 
politicize issues properly and uh, get the message across to other elected officials. We need uh, people who have worked in journalism, who know how to address the public and uh, address other journalists when there's misconceptions and uh, also tell us how to deal with it when we're misquoted or we're not being uh, paid attention to on a critical issue. And we need, of course, even informed voters who are spending the time to read bills and understand how they work and political activists. So, hand show. Who fits one of those categories? Who fits two, of, two or more of those categories? There's not a lot of people out there, so that makes it even more important that you guys help. Um, I know this is a much more specific skill set. I'm asking for like lawyers and stuff, and I have utmost respect for people who study computer law and then get an infosec and learn those two skill sets, but when you're out there and there are a few people giving talks, we really need your help. Um, and thanks to all the EFF lawyers who are giving talks every con, talking about this is the policy, this is how it affects you, making it human, making it understandable for people in security. But we need more of that, um, especially right now with all the new legislation about cyber coming into play. All right, problem number seven. Industrial control systems and SCADA. Um, all of our stuff is connected to networks now, and it's terrible, and it's terrifying. Um, power, water, electrical, oil and gas, the list goes on and on and on. Um, transportation infrastructures, our traffic lights, um, lots of things that are affect our daily lives in very, very critical ways are connected to IP networks or, uh, you know, more legacy networks that are still being at some point converted to IP. And we've proven multiple times during conferences that they are very, very vulnerable to attacks and in pen tests and in real life cases where there have been kinetic effects. Um, so far, fairly limited, but there's definitely been cases. I bet some of you are thinking about some right now. So this is a little bit harder to talk about. Um, we need people who, know, who understand and have learned electronics very well because we're often dealing with legacy computer systems. But even more critical than that, we need people who have worked on those legacy systems and now have moved into InfoSec. We need people who understand how computers in the 1970s and 1980s worked because a lot of those are still in place, albeit with IP conversion or translation, and they're still being used to control critical systems, and they've been made that much more vulnerable by their network. Um, we need people who know physical security. Um, we need people who know how to use Shodan. We need people who know legacy code. Um, so if you fit any of those roles, I think there might only be a couple of people out there who know any of those legacy systems or have worked uh, extensively with Shodan. I'd appreciate if you could raise a hand. But there's a few people out there. That's terrific, you guys. So again, we need more talks like these. Uh, we need people talking about how those, not just how those devices can be exploited, but how to secure them. And then, more importantly, the thing I see vastly missing out there is telling InfoSec people and hackers how those things work, okay? Because it may seem simple to you how a water pump from 1980 works or how an elevator works from 1978, but it's not simple to us. We have never seen that work before. We've never seen the diagrams for them. We've never seen what kind of traffic they generate, especially if it's proprietary. We need you to get out there and tell us how things work so we can learn how to secure them. All right, Internet of, um, Internet of Things. So uh, we connect a lot of stuff to the Internet, right? Uh, everything from uh, TVs and phones to now, like, Barbie dolls and stuff. Um, we connect a lot of stuff to the Internet, and it's really terrible. And uh, people want to buy those things cheap, and they want them to do cool things on their apps, on their, apps and their phones or whatever. So cheap production, fast production, that means cutting corners and security. And so we've got a lot of insecure devices out there on the internet that were cheaply made, poorly documented, and as we've learned with uh, Mirai and Dyne, uh, a, a great attack vector. And then also, as we learned in the last uh, few days, possibly a, uh, well, we didn't learn that actually. We already knew that, that uh, IoT devices make great spy devices. We were talking about that like years ago, but as the rest of the public learned a couple days ago, uh, IoT devices uh, can be used to spy on people, and that's not necessarily talking about, you know, 
three-letter agencies, that's talking about people looking at people's baby cameras on Shodan um, and uh, all kinds of other things that are harmful to people's privacy. So this is a kind of broader category, but uh, if you buy IoT devices for your kids or your family, if you bought them for Christmas for people, why not sit down with them and figure out how they work? Um, if you're buying them, if you're designing them, uh, if you work for a company that makes them and you have access to the devices when they're in production or even after they're in production and they're out on the shelves, that you're a wonderful candidate to start taking them apart and figuring out how to secure them better. And uh, if you just like electronics, um, a lot of things are, are um, open to you that way. So if you buy IoT cameras, toys, home security appliances like baby monitors like I was talking about, um, or uh, home appliances that are IoT, which are sometimes your only option when you're buying appliances now. Spend some time learning how to take them apart and tell us how you did it. Put it on your blog. Tell us how they're insecure once you've reported uh, ethically. Um, so if you fit into one of those categories there in this Venn diagram, if you could raise your hand. You bought an IoT thing, you work for an IoT company. Um, yeah, okay, so there's a bunch of people out there who could be doing some IoT research. It doesn't take a lot of time. You know, go to IoT Village at a con and, you know, um, you, can, you can do a lot of good in a day or two. And, of course, we have endless talks about cool IoT stuff and there's endless possibility to talk about new stuff. Um, obviously, uh, Hello Barbie being the most high-profile, amusing uh, example in recent history, but... We have all kinds of interesting talks, like Runa Sandovic's uh, Linux-powered rifle, getting up there on stage with it. That was amazing. Um, if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it, especially if you like firearms. Um, but yeah, there's potential to tear into all of those devices, and I really need your help there. All right, medical device security. This is a matter of life or death. Um, a lot of these things that we've talked about, I mean, yeah, uh, ICS, when you're talking about like traffic control, could be a matter of life and death. But for the most part, the things we've talked about so far are nuisances. They make it hard for us to do our job. They make us, it hard for us to do business. But medical device security, that's like people living versus people dying. Um, and then even beyond that, there's still patient records with tremendously personal data that we've seen breached over and over and over again. Uh, there's... Um, the threat of ransomware, where we see like medical establishments and hospitals being taken for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because they don't have backups and they get hit with ransomware. And the most critical thing being medical devices and, you know, uh, either uh, medical devices that are external or internal to the body. So medical device security. We need some doctors and we need some healthcare workers here. I mean, even if you did it 20 years ago, you can still lend a lot to the conversation. We need people who have worked in healthcare and tell us how healthcare, the foibles of how healthcare operates. We need people who have been EMT and worked with medical devices. We need people who, even in a volunteer status, work as a first responder. Um, we need people who have actually used or have, you know, people in a few degrees of separation who are close to them who use medical devices that are networked. Um, and uh, we need people who have been caregivers of people who need medical devices. Because, not just because it's important to you, but because you have firsthand experience in the foibles and the issues in securing those systems and how they actually operate in a real environment. The manual can only tell you so much about how like a, pace a pacemaker works. I don't have a pacemaker. I don't know what it's like to have a pacemaker or have one installed. I don't know how often they need maintenance. Um, I don't know if there's different types. That's just not something I've ever torn into. But I know there's people out here who know the answers to all of those questions. If you could get up here for half an hour or 15 minutes and tell us how pacemakers work, and from a network perspective, when we're talking about like Bluetooth devices, what they do and why they need to do it, that would be so critical for doing more security research and inspiring people to get more interested in that research. So if you fall into any of those categories, healthcare, EMT, first responder, um, within a few degrees of a person who uses a medical device um, or um, requires some uh, consistent medical care that re uh, involves medical devices, um, if you've been a caregiver um, or you work in medical products or for a medical product company, um, if you could raise a hand, raise two if more than one applies. 
I know that this can be a sensitive subject, but again, we are dealing with matters of life and death. Um, we're dealing with, can this pacemaker be hacked, or can it not be hacked? And how do we deter it being hacked if, if it is already vulnerable? What do we do? Who do we report it to? We need you to talk about those things, if you can, um, because you could honestly be saving lives. Um, Okay, so there's been a lot of interesting talks on medical devices. Um, Scott Irvin does tons of talks, and they're all fascinating. Um, I really liked um, the most recent Schmookon. Jeff Dodge did a talk on uh, where he was. An, I mean, this is the, this is the kind of situation where you analyze a device that is relevant to you, that you have experience with, and you are talking about something that's utterly fascinating to people. Um, cyborg self hacking. Um, and then, um, of course, there's simpler things like HIPAA that we can, I, I really liked the talk from uh, Louisville Infosec on what healthcare can learn from the banking industry. That's somebody who's in the banking industry talking about bringing that skill set over to medical devices and the medical field. So again, taking multiple fields, bridging them together, and doing security better. All right, finally, poor device security. Um, and this is about software dev. And, a secure dev. Developers still lack uh, tack on security instead of building it in from the ground up. Um, new devices, it, we're talking about the problem of cutting corners in security because we need to get things out fast. Um, we need more stuff, we need it out faster, we have less budget, we have less people, and uh, then there's a more fundamental problem that people aren't being taught to code securely, which is very unfortunate. And we need people's help with that. And um, for that, we're going to need people who are info, in InfoSec now who have experience as a coder, a programmer, a developer, software engineer, people especially who have worked in DevOps and understand how that works. Um, and then we can also get a lot of insight from project managers and evangelists and um, even software consumers. So if you're any of those things, if you could raise a hand, we need your help. Yeah, hopefully everybody's hand is up because we're talking about software consumers. Oh my god. All right, you guys. There are huge problems in the software development life, life cycle pertaining to security. And you can all give insights and you can all out, do outreach to the software development community. Um, and there's been a lot of interesting talks, including one this weekend that I thought was really cool by David Moore. Is he here? I don't know. But uh, that was super awesome, uh, trying, to, trying to make fuzzing more available. Um, we need your help figuring out how to fix the problem of inserting security after the fact instead of building in from the ground up. And that can include everything from educating students who are learning how to program about security to figuring out how to solve those problems at a corporate level. So we need a lot of help solving that problem. But it's doable. It's fixable. So I added an extra one because you guys aren't totally sick of me talking yet, I hope. And that is us. Um, InfoSec has a huge problem with burnout. And unfortunately, it has problems with other things too, like substance abuse and alcoholism. Um, we've had some suicides in the community. Um, we have health problems. And there's a lot of very healthy, happy people in our field. And I certainly don't want to give the impression that we're a bunch of drunks or delinquents or something, because we're not. But there are problems that exist, and we should recognize them. And then, even beyond those more dire problems, we're in an echo chamber, and it's very frustrating. We can hardly ever break out. Um, we're often talking to ourselves inside our own conferences. And that can make problems seem really insurmountable, like the problems we just discussed today. And there's a lot of people out there who have experience who can help us start fixing those problems. And those are a wide range of backgrounds and hobbies and niches that we've experienced in our lives. From people who have been mentors, who know how to do mentoring for young people getting into the field or people who are having a hard time. Nutritionists, who can tell us how to eat and live better um, when we're struggling with that, with long hours and hardly any time off. Um, healthcare professionals who can talk about the impact of stress and what we should do about it. Um, fitness coaches who can tell us how to be healthier people. People who are, you know, the old gym rats. I'm kind of a gym rat, so 
yeah, people who like, like the fitness thing and enjoy it and it's their hobby, don't be ashamed of liking sports and being an infosec. Tell us how to be healthier. That's really important. Counselors who know how to sit down with people who are having trouble. Um, and then finally, just friends and human beings who have dealt with these problems and uh, maybe have gone through these same things themselves at some point in their lives. So if you fit any of those categories, are there a few friends and humans in here? Are they, I'm, I'm going to walk around and see if anybody's not raising their hand if they're a human. Because that'd be awesome if there's an alien in here. That'd be so cool. Anyway, all right, you guys. That's a really important problem. And people are, like, struggling and in serious, serious problems. And all it would take is your expertise in this thing that you think is totally unimportant and unrelated to InfoSec and it makes you a less cool hacker. Getting out there and talking about it for half an hour could change their life. You could change somebody's life. And there's been some interesting talks about that. Jack Daniel does a wonderful talk series on, uh, on you know, he, he talks a lot about health and well wellness in InfoSec now. Um, but there's been talk on suicide risk awareness, um, how to uh, deal with burnout, um, how to deal with stress. But we need more of that. I mean, look at the years on some of these. These, have, uh, these were a few years ago. There's, there's plenty of space for you to help. All right. So we've talked about a lot of problems today, a lot of things that a lot of us are really stressed out about that seem insurmountable in 2017, 2018, and beyond. But none of those problems are insurmountable. I just gave you a bunch of avenues where you guys can help solve them. And maybe it's not the leadest talk. Maybe you're not up here, you know, poning boxes. But it's really important that you bridge those pieces of experience together. With a little hard work, we can solve those problems. And for every daunting challenge that people brought up when I surveyed them, a cross-discipline uh, cross skill set can solve that problem, or multiple cross-discipline skill sets. Um, and those non-technical skills that you think are embarrassing or boring, you're like, oh my god, I did 10 years of work in this field before I moved to InfoSec, and now there's going to be ageism, and I'm never going to be a cool hacker. That's not true. You're going to be the coolest hacker because you're going to take those 10 years of experience doing something else and tell us how to tie those into InfoSec. You don't have to be the leadest hacker to be really helpful, to give a talk, to motivate people. And you're not alone. You know, if you're interested in one of these topics and you're like, well, I kind of know about this, but I'm missing this part of the Venn diagram, go find somebody else who's interested in it too. And combine both of your skill sets and make your full Venn diagram of skills to solve the problem. Be clever, but no. InfoSec hacking training will make you the best hacker in the world. That comes from you. That comes from your experience as a human being. That comes from you being well-rounded and having interesting, creative ideas. All right, let's talk. We got a few minutes. Anybody have any questions, comments, stories? Go ahead. Hi, Leslie. Hi. All right, well, you're going to have to get some basic skills in security somehow. Um, but a lot of that isn't coming into a job interview saying, I know how to use all these tools and I'm awesome at poning boxes. It's more like I have an interest in security and I want to learn more about it and uh, this is what I've been doing to learn about security or what I've been reading. So having like a home lab and saying, I don't know a lot yet, but I built a lab at home, I followed this blog, I've tried to learn some basic tools, and I think it's really interesting because I saw this talk or that talk. Showing that motivation and interest, and then saying, I'm bringing in these other skills. Like, I know personally you ran a business, which is awesome. And uh, I, was, I was gushing over that yesterday. I'm like, oh my god, you actually know how to like, hire your employees and manage people and manage time? You know, that's all wonderful stuff that is really beneficial to doing any kind of work, including InfoSec work. So. Take those skills that are like non-hacking specific that still are very beneficial to InfoSec and then combine them with, I'm interested in this. I really want to learn this. I'm motivated to learn more. This is what I've done so far. Make sense? 
Cool, thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments, thoughts? All right, all right. Um, well, we kind of did the hand raises for the aviation thing, but um, do we have any pilots in here? All right, we've got some pilots. Do we have any avi uh, avionics people other than me in here? AMPs, people who know avionics. Do we have any crew chiefs or flight engineers in here? All right, we've got a few. All right. I think that we could probably get a plane on the ground without it being in pieces with the people in this room. And that was totally off the seat of my pants, so I'm really, really glad that somebody raised their hand there. <laughs> so thank you. That was fun. All right. Well, you know, a number of hours, over 10,000 10, hours in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Anybody? All right. Awesome. Awesome. I feel safer already. Yep. I, I trust you guys. I trust you guys not to crash the plane. All right, who else? Go ahead. He has an airport where you, if nobody heard that, he has an airport where you can land the plane. It's really great. I, I'm not gonna dig into that right now. All right, you guys, anybody else? Thank you all for participating and for raising your hands and making my demo not fail miserably. I really appreciate it. Um, I also appreciate everybody coming out to B-Side Salt Lake City. The team here has been wonderful. If we could give the team who put on B-Side Salt Lake City a round of applause, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs>